Good evening. Welcome to Empower You. If I could ask everyone to please take a seat. It's good to see a lot of you here. Welcome to those of you online. Uh, I just want to thank those of you that have been so generously giving to um, help us in our effort to bring good classes to you. If you're in the studio, you know we always pass the red buckets around. So if you see one coming soon, you'll know what that's for. I just want to remind you also tonight, if you have any questions and you're in the studio, please raise your hand so one of us can bring a microphone to you. If you're not talking into a microphone, the people online can't hear you and many of the people in the studio can't hear you. Hear you. That goes for comments also, if we can get a microphone to you, if you just have a comment. I want to talk a few minutes about um, the upcoming classes. On Saturday, we're having a class on homeschooling. Thea Shoemake, who has um, raised her kids in homeschooling, is going to be teaching that. If you know anybody that's even thought about grandkids or a neighbor or anybody that's even thought about homeschooling and they think they're not sure if it's for them, this is the class to tune into, either online or come to the studio, because this will help you decide whether or not this is a good fit for your family. Then on Next Tuesday, we don't have a class because that's election day. So I want to encourage those of you, even though it's an off year, to go out and vote. On Wednesday, we're going to have Bellwether Blues. Jonathan, I'm, I know I'm going to butcher his name, Jocko Bosky, something like that. He's written a book on Bellwether Blues, and it has to do with millennials leaving the left and what that means and how to talk to millennials. So it'll be a very interesting class. Before him, we're gonna have Kelly Coles. She's a, I believe she's a former school board member, but she does do score, school board member training. And then on Thursday, we're gonna have a class on Booker T. Washington. Professor Gregory McBrayer from Ashland University is coming down here to talk about Booker T. Washington and his life. We do have posted on the website two documents about Booker T. Washington that the speaker asked us to put on there and ask you to read ahead of the class so that you would have a better, better understanding of what he's talking about. And then also that night, we're gonna have uh, before Booker T. Washington, Kareen Vidal's, and she is uh, gonna be talking about the backpack bill. Um, I don't know if you know what that is, but my understanding is the backpack bill is if you have a child in school and uh, 20, let's say $25,000 goes to that public school for that child and you want to take that child and put them in another school, private school, homeschooling or whatever, the money would go with them. So I don't know where they are on that. Uh, I don't know what the chances are of that passing, but um, it's a good bill. Tonight, we're gonna to have our managing board member, Dan Reganalt. He's gonna be talking about wage and price controls for about 20 minutes. And before he gets started on that, we're gonna do our door prize drawing. So get out your prize tickets. How's everybody doing tonight? Welcome. Glad to have you here tonight. Good to see so many people online. So, we're going to do a first, an Empower You first ever, and that's we're going to let the winner tonight pick their prize. So, and we've got some great ones. We've got the American Marxism book, which is up in my office. I forgot to bring down. I know a lot of you have read it already. So if you don't want to, uh, that and you win, gosh, this is a great book that just came out by Molly, Molly Hemingway called Rigged um, to make a good prize for somebody. And then this book, I, I'm going to make sure it's on my Christmas list and tell my wife to buy it early, right? And that's Brett Baer's book on To Rescue the Republic about uh, Ulysses S. Grant. So we're going to pick a winner. And that ticket number is, how about 768? Right here, sir. Come on up. You get to choose. Your name, sir, is George. Okay. So, George, you can pick rigged, you can pick, pick Red Bear, or you can pick American Marxism, which is up in my office. Tough choice. Yes. 
Let's give our winner a round of applause. And then um, we'll pick an online winner. There's so many people online tonight. It's great to see you. And we'll announce that before the end of the evening. Thank you, Betty. So uh, just a couple quick things before I, I, I start. Um, I haven't had a chance to introduce you to somebody who's been such a big help to empower you this semester. And that's John O'Neill. He's sitting in the back hiding behind the gentleman in the blue. Can you all turn around and uh, say hi to John? Give him a round of applause. John has been responsible for all of our, what we're calling Take 20 Speakers, which is kind of our first segment, usually about 15 or 20 minutes tonight. Um, and he's just come up with some great speakers this semester. And I, I just am so thankful, John, for your help in so many ways. Um, like I said, Kelly Coles will be here next Wednesday. We don't have a class Tuesday because it's election day. Kelly Coles will be here Wednesday talking about school boards and which one's won and which one's lost. And then we'll have somebody talking about the backpack bill the day after that. And then a week from Tuesday night, I'm pleased to announce that Jim Renacy, uh, candidate for governor, will be appearing virtually at Empower You. He's gonna talk about something that could be a game stopper in Ohio. And that is about doing away with property taxes to people 65 and older. Um, now, can I get a round of applause on that? Come on. Heck, man. If we're given free, co if, if, if college is free and everything else is, why we can't, we can't, it's so good to see, it's so good to see you guys back too. We should be able to give uh, seniors at least a, ma a major break. Jim will be here uh, appearing virtually with us that night. And you don't want to miss that session. That's November the 9th. The other big announcement um, that I wanted to make tonight, I know that um, several of you have been following my efforts, um, many people's efforts to stop critical race theory in the state of Ohio. And I was thrilled about an hour, an hour ago when I learned that the president of the State Board of Education will resign tomorrow. And uh, let's give a, how about a round of applause for that? That's a great thing. Um, from what I understand, um, the governor has told her that she won't be reappointed and she's made a decision to resign, which I think is a great personal move on her part. So I've got one of these eight balls at home. You know, you know what I mean when I say eight balls? You know that you get to make uh, forecasts into the future. And I've been looking at it in my office and um, I've been worrying a lot about all this bad news that we hear on the TV. And I've been thinking for some reason, the idea in my mind came, well, all this crazy stuff that's going on with the border, with inflation, with uh, the supply chain mess, with Afghanistan, um, what's next? What could be crazy? And I thought to myself, do you remember when wage and price controls started? How many of you are old enough to remember um, what happened? No, I know I am. And uh, I thought to myself, it's been so crazy, I, I wouldn't at all be surprised. So I wanted to just talk to you a minute about wage and price controls because there's one thing at the end of the session, if you wanna zone out on what I say, then feel free to zone out for the first 10 minutes or so. There's just one thing at the very end, I want you all to be, to remember about the conversation about what'll happen if wage and price controls come. And I wouldn't rule it out at all just because of everything else crazy that's happened you know, in, in the United States. So let's talk about it a little bit. So the, the question is, wage and price controls, do they work? Let me take you back. And also it's the 50th anniversary of Richard Nixon implementing wage and price controls in the United States. I remember it um, pretty well. And uh, let's just, uh, you guys remember this guy. Some of you remember this guy, right? Let's just hear what he had. You were no better off. We have made progress against the rise in the cost of living. From the high point of 6% a year in 1969, the rise in consumer prices has been cut to 4% in the first half of 1971. But just as is the case in our fight against unemployment, we can and we must do better than that. The time has come for decisive action, action that will break the vicious circle of spiraling prices and costs. I am today ordering a freeze on all prices and wages throughout the United States for a period of 90 days. In addition, I call upon corporations to extend the wage price freeze to all dividends. 
I have today appointed a cost of living council within the government. I have directed this council to work with leaders of labor and business to set up the proper mechanism for achieving continued price and wage stability after the 90 day That's freeze. That's what happened 50 years ago. Um, inflation was only 4% when wage and price controls were implemented in the United States. Um, so, how does inflation really happen? It's simple, it's what you know. It's just the cost of production rises. Like here at Frame USA, we make frames out of, out of wood. When the price of wood goes up, well, what do we have to do? We do what we did this week, we raise prices. And when we raise prices and everybody raises prices like McDonald's and Chipotle and everyone else, then workers feel these cost of living rises. And so they come and they say, we need more money to live. And that one thing just feeds another and wages just keep uh, rising. And that's really what causes inflation. So how is inflation measured? It used to be measured, it used to be straightforward but then the government got involved as it usually does. There used to just be a basket of goods with like 280 items in there. And every month they would just measure that basket of goods. Simple, right? Makes sense. Well, some economists got the idea and what's included in that is really everything, food, beverages, cereal, milk, coffee, housing costs, bedroom furniture, just about everything. For those of you wondering how big of a component gas is, gas comprises 6% of the, of the cost of living uh, index. But the goal is to keep inflation to 2%. There's also something called a producer price index, which is, as a manufacturer, I'm more worried about. But there's been a big controversy on the cost of living index because there's new methodology. And what it's called is changes in purchases by consumers in response to price changes. And here's how it works. So let's say you're used to having filet mignon on Friday night for dinner. It's your favorite thing you want to eat. Filet mignon goes from $15 a pound to $20 a pound. So since money is always tight, you make a decision, well, I'm going to go to buying ribeye steaks. And the ribeye steaks are only $15 a pound. Well, the way the cost, the CPI works, since it's the same price, they don't count that as an increase at all. It's kind of um, government math. And so... And so most people believe there should just be a standard basket of goods measured forever, but there isn't. And many economists believe that the actual CPI is about twice what it is. So the CPI right now is 5.39%. Many people believe it's actually about twice that. And remember, the government wants to keep that rate down because they link Social Security and a lot of um, transfer payment programs to the cost of living index. So, yeah, I don't know who's that, who that is, but, um, okay, great. Tell them we said hello. Um, so the economic term for wage and price controls, it's called an incomes policy. They go back in time forever. There's examples of rulers all the way through history raising prices and uh, holding prices and wages. The Old Testament prohibited interest on loans. One of the first examples happened in France in 1970s in the French Revolution. And it was a crime that if you raised prices back then, you could, be, uh, you could receive the penalty of death for doing it. Um, it's usually done in response to establish wages and prices that are below a free market level. And some forms of wage and price controls are voluntary and some are mandatory. And the wage and price controls in Nixon's whole run differed. Some, it started out voluntary, but became mandatory with several of them. The problem with wage and price controls is they distort, distort the allocation of resources. They mess with supply and demands. And then there's always problems with consumers like us that try to figure out a way to get around the wage and price controls. They just never, never work. So um, wage and price controls happened in World War II. Um, they happened in the Korean and Vietnam Wars. However, the Supreme Court stopped them at one time during Harry Truman's reign. And um, the biggest problem with inflation is it's a silent tax. It lessens your purchasing power as it happens. It makes it harder to keep up. But governments like it because they owe all this money. What is it, 28, is it? $28 trillion we owe, is that the number? Um, and if there's inflation, they can pay that money back 
in dollars that don't cost as much. So in some cases, it can be a, um, a good thing for them. So Nixon, in 71, 50 years ago, he announced uh, at the end of the Bretton Woods gold standard, you guys, gold used to be, it used to be important, it used to mean something. At the end of the gold standard, he was worried about inflation, so he imposed a 90-day wage, wage price freeze. It was only 4% when he did that. And the concern was that Nixon thought there'd be a large inflation increase due to the gold standard. Everybody almost in the United States 50 years ago applauded it, thought it was the right thing to do, thought 4%. How could we exist with a 4% inflation rate? Um, and at one point, there was a wage and price commission, pay standards, and uh, many people thought the wage and price controls Nixon put in were because of Vietnam, but they weren't. We were really only spending about 10% of our GDP on the war. And uh, inflation last year, last month was 5.39%. So what were the results of the wage and price controls 50 years ago? The long-term effects were destabilizing. After the initial price controls were relaxed, uh, overly expansionary policies pushed inflation even more. You started to have grocery stores, their shelves, stuff on the shelf disappeared like now. Americans protested the controls. Things got so bad that Business Week editorialized in favor of semi-permanent wage and price controls. When Jimmy Carter took over in 1977, now this is six years after the initial set of wage and price controls. There were wage and price controls for those six years. In 1977, the inflation rate was 5.22%, but four years later under Jimmy Carter, it hit a high of 14.78%, which is high. Um, and the results were the, the controls were damaging to the economy. There were all sorts of issues with oil and there was never enough of it. George Shultz, which many of you probably know who that is, Nixon's treasury secretary told Nixon in 73, wage and price controls are not the answer. You might remember this guy, Gerald Ford, 1974, took over for Nixon. He created something called WIP, WIP, WIP. Uh, it was called WIN, WIP Inflation Now. He tried to spur get grassroots movement to try to get us to all be more concerned about inflation. And the lasting results were inflation came roaring back. It persisted through all of the 70s. And it's something Milton Friedman said, we'll hear from him just a short clip in a minute, but he said a tight lid on a boiling pot can only contain the steam for a certain amount of time before it boils over. And once it boils over, it's hard to ever get it back. It was only when the Fed chairman, Paul Volcker, really tightened monetary supply to a point where interest rates were so high that he was able to get inflation back in control. A lot of businesses went out of business then. They couldn't borrow money. They couldn't expand. It was a terrible time. Um, an example, this was the first house I bought, 1983, um, Dunkirk Road, Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, I went out to get a, a mortgage, 13.75% interest on my first mortgage. Just to give you an idea what that means, what could happen if inflation just keeps going and gets out of control, that meant my month, monthly payment was $780.63. That would compare to like a 3% interest rate now of 282.47, $500 a month difference. Now the house prices were a lot different then, but I, I wanna give you a sense, if inflation gets, if it's 10% now, I think it's probably maybe higher, don't you think? When you go out to the stores and you see everything that's going on, that when it gets that high, it's almost impossible to ever get, to get back. It's so hard, there has to be hardships. There have to be people that, um, people are hurting. This is a guy that um, I love listening to and just a short clip, this is Milton Friedman talking about um, wage and price controls. Yes, sir. Uh, let me see. Uh, my question on was, uh, was economists have been speculating the issue of reestablishing price and wage Jay, can you start that? Uh, I guess you just commented on that. Uh, would you like to elaborate on that a little further? <laughs> <laughs> I am afraid that the chances that we shall have price and wage controls are unfortunately not negligible. It is a device that governments have repeatedly resorted to. Yes to try to cover up 
the effects of their own policy. Was, uh, was it is offered as a cure for inflation. It is not uh, a cure for inflation. It has uh, never been a uh, cure for inflation. Like uh, it is an uh, alleged uh, cure uh, that is far uh, worse uh, than the uh, disease. Uh, unfortunately, not negative. It is a device that governments have repeatedly resorted to to try to cover up the effects of their own policies. It is offered as a cure for inflation. It is not a cure for inflation. It has never been a cure for inflation. It is an alleged cure that is far worse than the disease. When dealing with inflation, wage and price controls are far worse than the disease. So this is the one thing, you guys have to be my educators if things get really bad out there. And this is the one thing I want you to take from my message tonight. There's never been a period of wage and price controls that have not been followed by a period of hyperinflation or inflation, never, under any circumstances throughout history. If this inflation thing continues and gets out of control and wage and price controls are put on, and by the way, my required reading article tonight talks about how the Fed is already looking at ways they can, on their own, control important prices for fuel, food, raw materials, metals, natural resources, home prices, and wages. So it's already on the drawing board. We'll have this for 10 years, just like we did in the 70s. And I just want you to all put that on your, um, on your eight ball and understand if you're a business, Raise prices now, don't get stuck. Don't get stuck on the back end. And if you're a consumer, do whatever you can um, to, uh, to protect yourself because it could go on for a long time. Be prepared for it and don't get caught um, behind the eight ball. And just that's, I just wanted to share that with you from 50 years ago. So I've had so many people tell me how excited they are about tonight's class and about, um, I'm excited to have our speaker, Luke Perry here. Luke and I met on the summer, over the summer, and he was so helpful uh, helping me write uh, and do some things on a couple campaigns we're working on. So he is an entrepreneur and a Cincinnati native. He'll speak tonight about Mark Levin's book. Luke became involved in community politics in 2020 as he witnessed the rise of CRT and the abuse of government's emergency power surrounding COVID. Now Luke writes the weekly email for Empower You Sister Group and he engages with his local, state, and federal government representatives on a regular basis to discuss important issues. Luke is um, board chairman of the Ohio Valley Associated Builders and Contractors, an organization of nearly 300 businesses. He's active in family, general contracting, and also active in the Goring Center at UC. In his spare time, Luke enjoys exercising, competitive shooting, hunting, and bothering his wife. Uh, Luke, come on up. Welcome to Empower You, Luke Perry. Thank We're you. Glad you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. That much appreciated. It's all right. There you go. Thank you. Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you very much for having me tonight. Tell me what I should do if I should move or adjust for that ringing there. Okay. All right, okay. Uh, Dan, thank you for that short take 20 there. That was um, sufficiently terrifying. Um, <clears throat> I, I didn't know much about wage and price controls and, uh, and now I'm, I'm uh, I'm good and scared, and it sounds like a terrible idea, which guarantees that Joe Biden will try to do it. So we have that to look forward to. Okay. Uh, American Marxism. <clears throat> this is a book by Mark Levin, the great one, tonight presented by Empower You and me, Luke Perry. And thank you for the introduction there, by the way, Dan. I'm not going to go any further into that because there's a lot of ground to cover tonight. So we are going to jump right in. I think it is proper that we start with a definition of Marxism. Marxism is the political, economic, and social principles and policies ad advocated by Karl Marx, especially a theory and practice of socialism, including the labor theory of value, dialectical materialism, the class struggle, and dictatorship of the proletariat until the establishment of a classless society. 
Couple things I'd like you to realize about that definition. First, it's from Merriam-Webster. That's probably the most authoritative dictionary resource out there. Uh, the first thing I want uh, you to realize about the definition though is that Marxism requires class conflict. It requires class struggle. If the conflict doesn't exist, Marxists must create it. That is the justification for and the prerequisite for their one party control. That is to correct the conflict between the classes. But the craziest part of this definition is that dictatorship is literally the policy prescription for Marxism. Marxism naturally flows to dictatorship. I was, uh, I just think that's mind blowing, right? Okay, so we ask ourselves, has Marxism ever worked? I'm sure everybody in this room here knows the answer. The answer is no, it has not. It has led to the misery and deaths of tens of millions of people everywhere that it has been tried. There's not a nation state on earth that has ever had any success implementing Marxism. And off we go. Chapter one, titled, It's Here. What's here? Marxism is here, and it is a threat. Marxism is in the newsrooms, it's in schools, it's in universities, it's in corporations, it's even in the Oval Office. American Marxism, Levin says, is the application of core Marxist teachings to American society and culture. But Marxism is still an unpopular term today. So what do Marxists call themselves today? How about BLM or progressives or the squad or environmental justice movement? All of these groups have different top line monikers, different top line agenda items. But if you read past the first paragraph of their manifestos or founding documents, you will start to see that all of their policy pursuits coalesce around the central, central themes of Marxism. Who is the enemy for Marxists? Levin answers this for us in chapter one. He says that Marxists direct their wrath at the existing society and culture, which must be toppled if life is to have meaning and start over in a newly minted egalitarian paradise. Finally, <clears throat> a pretty obvious characteristic of Marxism, it cannot tolerate political competition. Do we see any evidence of leftists, Marxists today, doing things to try to eliminate the political competition? Social media, tech censorship, yeah. How about, how about the people in government directly acting to eliminate their political competition? <laughs> Trying to take over all federal elections with the HR1 bill, that's a great example. How about the threat to eliminate the filibuster? How about the threat to add states to cementing a democratic majority in the Senate that will likely never be undone? Um, stacking the Supreme Court, tons of examples. One of my favorites is the Democratic senators actually writing open letters to cable carriers like AT&E and Comcast saying after January 6th, and they said, what are you gonna do about carrying conservative news networks on your, on your, uh, on your platforms? And don't you bear some responsibility for carrying conservative news on your, uh, on your platforms after January 6th? If that's not a thinly veiled threat, uh, from the government to try to eliminate their political competition. I don't know what is. Okay, so who supports Marxism? Levin says that Marxism and its oppressor versus oppressed formulation is especially seductive to the malcontented, disenchanted, and disaffected. For them, individual liberty and capitalism expose their own shortcomings and failings. So basically, People who support Marxism tend to be people who are dissatisfied with their life for one reason or another. But instead of looking inward and evaluating, asking tough questions like maybe, okay, what decisions have I made that, ended, that put me in this dissatisfactory place? Uh, what actions have I taken that have put me here? Instead of looking inward, they look outward and they blame this nebulous oppressor that they call the system. The system has victimized them. Despite all of the evidence that shows that the American system has served hundreds of millions of people so well, it served all of us so well, but the Marxist doesn't see that. They see themselves as a victim and they're quite selfish because their solution is to destroy the system and take away 
the good service that the system did for all those hundreds of millions of other people. Well, it didn't do that good service for this Marxist over here. So his solution is to blow it up for everybody else. It's like a, it's like a petulant child with a toy almost. If, if, if he can't have it, he's gonna break it so nobody else can have it. So at heart, Marxists might try to convince you that their political perspective is one of selflessness and sharing and the collective, but it's really just about the selfish, most selfish political ideology that you can come by. All right, to close out chapter one, Mark Levin talks about the purpose of this book. He says, the purpose of the book is to awaken American patriots to the threat of Marxism. He asks us to acknowledge and label American Marxism for what it is in order to unify around fighting in it. I think that's pretty important. Naming something and labeling something accurately is very important today. We see our language changing so rapidly uh, in front of our eyes. Um, we have tons of new pronouns to deal with. Um, and here's a, here's a really interesting example about how quickly definitions change. I don't know if any of you remember the Supreme Court hearings for Amy Coney Barrett. Uh, she was being asked a question by Maisie Hirono from, from Hawaii. And in uh, uh, Coney Barrett's response to the Senator, she used the term sexual preference. At that moment, she was raked over the coals then by Maisie Hirono who said, or rather declared that sexual preference was an offensive term. Hours later, Merriam-Webster changed the definition of sexual preference on their online dictionary and included a notation to suggest that this was an offensive term or a pejorative term. That's how quickly language is changing today. And that really highlights why it's so important that we accurately label uh, all these special interest groups that are centered on Marxism as what they really are. They're Marxist organizations. They're pursuing Marxist goals. We need to be as precise and as accurate and convey as much information as we can with the words that we use. So just as Levin implores you to start describing these groups as Marxists, so do I. Chapter two, breeding mobs. <clears throat> This chapter has got a lot of quotes from the founders of Marxism um, and the expo expositors of Marxist ideology. It focuses on a few different things. The mindset of the supporters of Marxism. Uh, it focuses on the tools used to effectuate Marxism in society. And uh, note that Marxism, Marxism requires the sacrificing of individuality for the complete acceptance of the creed of the group. This is kind of the uh, the, tech, the, the, the technical way that Marxism is applied. So mass movements, that is a tool for implementing Marxism. Political mass movements seek to devour an individual's identity and assign a group identity because people are much easier to control when they all think the same. But that group identity part is very important. Black Lives Matter is an example of a subgroup uh, identity within the larger Marxist movement, because BLM, uh, their top line agenda is you know, race issues, but they, their, their demands quickly go beyond the issues of race into the usual Marxist demands for things like the destruction of existing society. And that very same play is applicable to each of the groups that we're gonna talk about tonight, whether it's Black Lives Matter or environmental justice or the gender theory people, it's all the same, different top line item, but at the heart of it, they're all trying to, uh, to put forward Marxist principles and bring those uh, to realization. Marxism is a religion. A lot of the quotes in this chapter have a similar theme. We talked about the sacrifice of the individual for a group identity and complete dedication to the cause of Marxism. In fact, a lot of the uh, prolific writers uh, and expositors of Marxism, they invoke religion frequently. And when I say they invoke religion, I don't mean that they say Jesus would want us to be a Marxist because uh, Marxists actually despise religion. They detest religion. Uh, but what they do is they draw uh, uh, comparisons to the devotion of religious people and they advocate for that same type of devotion to their Marxist causes. And we actually see this uh, on the left today quite a bit. The left is becoming increasingly secular and religion was a big part of everybody's life, you know, decades ago. Now that the left is becoming so secular, something is going to take the place of 
the spot that religion used to fill. And it's pretty obvious that that is quickly becoming politics and political causes. Politics is the new religion of the left, and it's got a pretty Marxist bent to it. This is exactly what the founders of Marxism would have would hope to see today is politics playing such a um, outsized role, especially on the political left. Brainwashing, another tool of Marxism. The Marxist movement relies on experts or intelligentsia engaged in developing and spreading utopian fantasies. Where do all of the Marxist think pieces come from today? Where do they come from? What's the source? Universities, tenured professors, they write all of the all of the think pieces that are featured in the news articles. It's people like Ibram X. Kendi, Nicole Hannah-Jones, Robin DiAngelo. They are the intelligentsia that are forwarding the ideas of Marxism. Levin says about brainwash, brainwashing, <clears throat> it is the true believer's ability to shut his eyes and ears to facts that do not deserve to be seen or heard when they contradict the Marxist agenda. That is how, that, that ability right there, that's how you end up with these ridiculous scenes of the CNN reporter standing in front of a burning building at a BLM riot while, while, uh, while claiming that things are mostly peaceful. We have a lot of examples of things like that happening today in our uh, society. Okay, sorry about that. Conflict, the uh, final tool that we'll talk about for, for Marxist, we said it's, it's one of the, it's a requirement of Marxism. Conflict is the requirement of Marxism. And Piven and Cloward, they're two pretty prolific uh, 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 writers for the, for the Marxist movement. Here's what they had to say about conflict and social movements and how Marxism uses social movements and conflict. Social movements thrive on conflict. By contrast, electoral politics demands strategies of consensus and coalition. Social movements have the impact that they do because they generate widened cleavages among voter groups. So I don't know that you can paint a clearer picture of, of the goal of how Marxism to, is to be implemented. It says it all right there. Uh, it's basically screw negotiating and coming to an agreement. Um, the Marxists want to, to drive a wedge between people and set people against each other to the point of destruction. And uh, basically that's a, a scorched earth approach, right? And the, and the Marxists are really just hoping that they come out on top. That's a pretty cynical perspective. Okay, chapter three, Hate America Inc. So what is Hate America Inc? It's basically, it's basically the source of Marxism today. It's the schools. Lenin, Mao and Pol Pot, uh, the, uh, the most horrific Marxist leaders that have ever, ever uh, walked on, the, on this earth, they all experienced their shift towards Marxism during their higher education experience. Marxism survives in academia. It's kind of like a parasite. It goes from woke professors to indoctrinated students, and then indoctrinated students, some of them become teachers or go to other you know, places in society. They carry that indoctrination with them often down the line to younger and younger pupils. And that is how Marxism propagates. And that's why today in some of our local schools, we're starting to see things like critical race theory and other Marxist ideas. They're starting to come up. That's how they got there. It's a school thing. Remember, Lenin said, give me just one generation of youth and I will change the world. Marxists and the left recognize how important education of the youth is. And um, it's time that we recognize that too and take back control of our educational system. Finally, this last quote here, the ultimate purpose of public education is to subsume the individual's will into the general will. Now, you might think that a Marxist wrote that, but actually no, that is Levin. Levin wrote that in his book and, and he's right about that. We all want our kids to learn to be uh, kind and to respect one another and learn basic life skills like reading and writing and communication and science so that they can become capable individuals. But we don't want them learning to hate their country and to see everything through such a jaded lens as Marxism requires. It's up to us where the aim of education is and it's time that we 
uh, put a little more effort into directing that aim. Okay, a lot of talk about free college right now. I think the Democrats are trying to get that into the reconciliation bill that uh, hopefully doesn't, hopefully won't go anywhere. Uh, but I know that that is a line item in there. Now, Levin keenly observed that the push for free college by Democrats is just really a push to indoctrinate more people with leftism. So that doesn't sound so good anymore, does it? Now, when people would approach me and talk about that free college proposal in the past, I would summarily dismiss it as that's, that's absurd because it's, it's financially irresponsible to ask the American taxpayer to pay for the education of 75 million people under the age of 18. It's just not possible, it's not doable. And I would discount it based on the financial perspective. I never really thought more about it, but that's a great point by Levin. The colleges are indoctrination factories. Higher academics are indoctrination factories. In case you have any doubt about that, he provides some evidence in this 2006 study right here by Neil Gross. He, uh, Neil Gross found that only 9% of college professors identify as conservative, and then only mildly so. Whereas a full one in five professors of social sciences self-described as Marxist. That was in 2006. Where do you think those numbers are today? Pretty, pretty nuts. Okay, Marxism, the enemy of freedom. Levin observes grandiose utopian plans, social engineering and the imposition of extreme governmental authority only work if imposed on an entire population. So that being the case, constitutionalism, American republicanism and capitalism, they really all stand in the way of that. So Marxists then, they must destroy those things because Marxism is about control and Americanism, that's about freedom. Students, uh, students in California are not gonna learn the same things in the same way that students in Mississippi are going to learn. You also won't find boys in the girls locker room in Mississippi like you might in California. And that is freedom right there. Because if you don't like the way things are going at your school in California, you can go to a different state or you can go to a different school district that aligns more with your values. But Marxists, they abhor that. They don't want you to have that freedom. They want you to learn their things and they want you to be damn happy about it. That is why we have the Department of Education at the federal level so that they can cram down ideological policy to the schools who would do otherwise if they had the option. John Dewey. He was a librarian. He was pretty fond of decimals, decimal system. He was also a communist. And he has some pretty illuminating uh, quotes here in this book that we, will, uh, that we will touch on briefly about schools and Marxism. Dewey visited the Soviet Union and he had this to say about the schools. The schools are in current phase, the ideological arm of the revolution. They're not hiding the ball guys. That is how Marxists feel about schools that they're indoctrination camps for Marxists. So don't let them tell you otherwise. Um, we also have to ask ourselves, do our schools today resemble that more and more? And I would suggest that they do as time goes on. It seems that not a week goes by where you don't read in the news or, or see on TV. There's some leftist teacher that has been teaching absurd lesson plans to their students or telling their white students to confess and denounce their white privilege or separating kids by race in class or doing some, some, sort of, some sort of absurd thing that's on the news on a weekly basis. So yes, uh, our schools continue to uh, seem to morph into mini indoctrination camps. Dewey continues with his commentary on the schools saying, the traditional customs and in institutions of the peasant, his small tracts, his three system farming, the influence of his home and church all work to automatically create in him an individualistic ideology. Hence, the great task of the school was to counteract and transform those tendencies towards that of the collective. So I don't know that there's a better quote there to describe Marxism than that. What they say, what they're saying is, you know, don't be an individual. Abandon the things that make you you. Abandon your home, your family, your church and come support the collective. And we can teach you how. 
at school. Isn't that great? That's, that's how Marxists view schools. America the Terrible. Well, then says, rather than learning allegiance to the nation's founding and ideals, successive generations of students are taught disdain for their own country, its history, and its founding, and are encouraged to renounce it. It's really important. Um, this is basically the realization of the targeting of the weapon of Marxism. It's planting the seed of Marxism. And the, the, the younger that you can convince children that their country is a terrible, horrible, awful, racist place, the more likely it is that in the future, they will be willing to go along with, along with radical transformation of and or the destruction of uh, the existing society and culture of America. Jean Anion, she had some interesting things to say about education. I call this saying the quiet part out loud. Here was her quote. We need to move our work beyond the classroom walls and into the worlds in which low income black and Latino immigrant students live. We can involve our students in contestation in public places, public struggles over rights, injustice and opportunity. Okay, Jean, first, that's a little bit racist. Uh, she's wanting you to use the brown people as her political tool to accomplish her political goals. And that's just another fine textbook example of indoctrination. And it brings up the image in my mind of little kids carrying their tiny AK-47s down the street in parade form, um, which is kind of the intent of uh, the indoctrination camps that seem to be resembling our schools more and more today. So what can you do about this? I would say, suggest that we stop sending our kids to be indoctrinated. Uh, if you are in a particularly contentious public school setting that you don't like, consider private, consider moving. If you are going to pay for your child to go to college somewhere, I would look real hard uh, at, at where they're choosing to go and whether or not you're gonna support that. Um, our political enemies, the Marxists, they've been really su successful in targeting and exploiting youth. It, and it's literally part of their playbook. And we have to understand that the primary battleground to fight Marxism, it's gonna be the schools. Um, you can't understate the importance of the education of our youth. And we really need to regain control of the situation uh, of education to ensure that it is politically neutral. Okay, chapter four, racism, genderism, and Marxism. This chapter is about all the subgroups, all the victimized classes of people that are being co-opted into the American Marxist movement. Uh, we're gonna talk about BLM and critical race theory, and we're actually gonna focus on those. There are other groups that Levin discusses in this chapter, namely Lat Crit and the gender theory people. Um, Lat Crit is just critical race theory, but for Hispanic people. Um, but the play is the same for all of them. Uh, so we're gonna focus on the BLM and critical race theory people. Since we're gonna be talking about theory, first we're gonna spend a second on traditional theory versus critical theory. A critical theory person would say of traditional theory, here's what they say, would say, laws, views, and morality of society are built to serve the needs of the powerful while disguising that very fact from the unwitting and less powerful. And a critical theorist then says about their own theory, critical theory, that it takes a critical perspective towards the powerful and seeks to expose an evil motive behind everything powerful people or institutions in society do. Takeaway from this is basically that critical theorists are the world's ultimate pessimists. They can take any situation and find fault in it. It's right in the name, it's critical theory. They look critically at everything. They criticize everything. Um, I'm remind, reminded of a several months old news story, but I think it was a pretty good example of this. You guys ever heard of the play Hamilton? Pretty, pretty popular play. There was something 
pretty, but, and, wide, and widely liked. There was something pretty unique about that play. What was it? You may know? You all know it. The cast was the cast because you had a whole bunch of black Broadway actors playing the roles of the white founding fathers. Did anybody complain about that? People thought that was cool. People maybe even liked the play a little bit more because of that fact, except for the critical theory people. They found the opportunity to criticize the guy that wrote that play by saying, you never should have written that because Alexander Hamilton owned slaves and now you put him on a pedestal and you made him more popular, you awful, terrible person. Why did you do that? That's what the critical theory people said to the dude that wrote the play. And he apologized for it. You can't ever apologize to those kind of people. You can't apologize to cancel culture. I'm not really gonna get into that a lot right now. Just never apologize to the cancel culture people. So instead of looking at that play and saying, wow, look what this play did. It took all these, all these black Broadway actors and, and elevated them and made them popular and made them famous and probably made them lots of money. Instead of looking at, it as, at that as a positive, they found a way to criticize that great piece of Broadway art. So um, critical theorists are not the most fun people. Here's what they say about tolerance in our country. They say that tolerance is a ruse. Marxists and critical theorists claim that tolerance in our society is just a tool of oppression for the powerful. That we have just enough tolerance to keep the people who disagree with us compliant. And basically it's like, like they're still, they're still controlled in, in a way. Tolerance is all a facade. Uh, so that's the perspective of the, of the Marxists and critical theorists. That's not true. Um, I think an easy way to prove this is to look back at the founding of our country and something called the Great Compromise. That occurred in 1787 at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. And the story goes like this. The young nation didn't, almost didn't come to be. Our founders were, uh, were meeting could not agree on a form of government. The large states wanted more representation. They had more people. Uh, they wanted representatives based on uh, the number, the, the size of their population. The small states wanted equal representation. Uh, they didn't want to be trampled over by the will of the big states. It's understandable, right? And the story goes that they were at an impasse. Everybody's tired of arguing. It almost fell apart. They're walking out of the hall where they are in Philadelphia, and this guy Sherman runs out on the steps and he proposes the two equal houses idea. And that's what became known as the Great Compromise. We had the House of Representatives, you get the number of representatives based on your population, you have the Senate where everybody gets two. Now, that was a great compromise. And the thing to take away from that is that our country, the foundation of our government is literally built on the principle of preserving the rights of the minority because that's what that compromise was. The small states didn't have that many people, they're a little tiny in area too. The small states uh, got their rights upheld by, by reaching that compromise and having the Senate there where they all have equal representation. So the rights of the minority, tolerance, acceptance of people who might have a, a different opinion than you, um, it's literally built into the foundation of our country. Tolerance is not a roost in America. Okay, critical race theory. Uh, Ibram McKendi and Robin D'Angelo are a couple of my, my, my favorite leaders of the CRT movement because they say the most outrageous things. And if you've read anything that they've written, you can come away with uh, uh, kind of these three ideas encapsulated in, in what they talk about. They say race, race is the primary factor to be used when identifying and analyzing people, events, and institutions. They also say that racism is ordinary and everywhere. Everything is racist, basically. They say that an individual's actions are insignificant. In other words, one does not have to actually do something racist to be deemed a racist. That is because America is systemically racist. And if America is systemically racist and you participate in society in one way or another, then you yourself have just thwarted racism. Therefore, you can be condemned as a racist. And from that line of thought uh, emerges the white privilege concept where white people must admit to and disown their white privilege 
and then support anti-racist policies, which is just code for uh, reverse discrimination. But here's what you need to understand about critical race theory. It is a, it's a hoax. Um, what critical race theorists do is they point to any discrepancy between group outcomes and they claim that it is because of racism. They never point to a law or policy that perpetuates racism because those do not exist and they haven't existed in this country since the civil rights movement. And they absolutely never consider that an individual's actions might have any impact on an individual's outcome. Critical race theory is often discussed as an analytical tool, a theoretical analytical tool. I say it's really only in higher education. Let me say that critical race theory is a horrible analytical tool because it is a single factor analytical tool. Anything that it looks at, it can only come away with one of two conclusions. It was, and those conclusions are because racism or there's not any racism. So it can provide no context. It can, yield, it can yield very little information as a parallel to that to illuminate how silly it is as, as, a, as an analytical tool. Consider if we had single factor analysis doctors. So if I break my arm and go to the doctor's office, say, doc, I think I broke my arm. He's like, all right, hop up on the table. Gets out his thermometer, takes my temperature, says, well, you don't have a fever, go ahead and get out of here. Yeah, doc, but I think my arm is broken. Well, see, I'm a single factor analysis doctor and I only use this thermometer right here. So if your arm's broken, you might have to go, you know, seek professional advice elsewhere. Kind of ridiculous, right? Single factor analysis doctor would be a pretty bad doctor. A single factor analysis theory is a pretty bad theory. Uh, CRT denies the solution to actual racial strife. I bring this up because I find it interesting. I've done a lot of reading on the topic. And I also read um, uh, the, the papers and articles and writers who, who kind of promote critical race theory. And I've always been interested in the fact that they quickly and often dismiss the application of colorblindness and the neutral applicability of laws. Early in their papers, early in their articles, they always do that. They say colorblindness is not the answer. Neutral applicability of laws is not the answer. And I, that, but that's what MLK, uh, that's what he fought for. That's what he realized was the solution to the, to the racial strife. And the fact that critical race theorists today are so quick to dismiss it, it's almost like it's a distraction tactic where they, so quickly want to sweep it under the rug. They feel they must address it. So they do it, they do it quickly at the beginning of their articles and then they don't mention it anymore. I always just found that, found that interesting. And I bring that up today um, in case you do some reading about critical race theory. I want to see if you observe the same thing. Okay, BLM. Black Lives Matter is Marxist. How do we know that? They told us, Patrice Cullors, the founder uh, when she was originally, when she was interviewed uh, several years ago, she, uh, she was asked about the ideological framework um, for Black Lives Matter, and she said, you know, we're, we have a Marxist ideological framework. And something about um, the Marxist ideology and Black Lives Matter, uh, it focuses, it, it, it attempts to destroy the nuclear family. That appeared originally in the founding documents of Black Lives Matter until about a year ago or something. They started getting some bad press from that and they removed that from their website. But that concept, destruction of the nuclear family is a common Marxist theme. By destroying families, people have no alternative source to get what families provide, which is acceptance and support. Humans seek that. If you don't have a family to get it from, you're gonna seek some other group to get it from and the Marxists, hope that you will get that from the collective. Now, it's not just um, special interest groups like BLM that had in their uh, political agenda destruction of the nuclear family. The government 
is also taking a shot at destroying the nuclear family. Can anybody think of some ways that they're doing that right now? It's a pretty obvious one that they've been doing for years. And that is that welfare payments to single parent families are higher than welfare payments for two parent families. If you wanted to promote a uh, stable family structure, the payments would actually be higher for families where there were two parents instead of, where there, where there, uh, instead of single parent families. They've been doing that for years. I wonder how many families have broken up for a bigger paycheck. Another way that they're doing it in deep blue states like uh, California, people under 18 no longer need parental permission to get an abortion or to start um, gender transition hormones or therapies or whatever you want to say. So those seem like pretty important family issues to me. And if the government is going to insert itself as a wall between parent and child for those really important issues, it seems to me it's a pretty clear signal that the government is attempting to destroy the nuclear family. Okay. The procession of the victimized. Well, then continues in this chapter to identify other groups being co-opted into the CRT folds. That includes the Latcrit movement, the gender theory movement. As I said before, all the same principles apply. These are victimized groups that should be given deference and allowed to tear out the foundations of our society so that they can rebuild it to their liking. Critical, critical theory is Marxism, is BLM, is Latcrit is environmental justice. It's the transitive property, essentially. They, they are all the same. Critical theory promotes the oppressor versus oppressed. So does Marxism. Critical theory targets existing societal norms and structures for destruction. So does Marxism. Eliminate the nuclear family. We just talked about that. Check. Equity over equality. Yes. So all these things, different top line monikers, but all the same under the surface. Chapter five. Climate change fanaticism. So I feel like this uh, was the most anti-capitalist anti sect of in this book. So I wanted to uh, bring up this point that, that Levin raised before we get into the meat of the chapter here. He says, Economic freedom and political freedom are intertwined. You cannot have one without the other. Economic freedom, i.e. capitalism, is essential to implementing man's right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay, so what is the environmental movement? It attacks American republicanism, republicanism constitutionalism, uh, and capitalism. It attempts to it attempts to uh, implement Marxism under the guise of environmentalism, and that overlaps, as do all the other special interest groups we've discussed, with many, uh, many other Marxist ideologies, including critical race theory via environmental justice. The environmental movement views productivity, growth, and material acquisition as toxic. That's the right to private property. Uh, and it promotes economic regression, egalitarianism, and autocracy. Out of the environmental movement springs the degrowth movement. Georgios Callas gives us the policy prescriptions for degrowth. Drastic changes to financial institutions. They take all your money and redistribute it as they see fit. Resource and pollution caps and eco taxes. They take control of the means of production via extreme regulation. Infrastructure moratoria. If you don't like cars, you're not going to build any more roads. Work sharing and reduced working hours um, seem just like laziness to me. Basic income and social security for all. Of course, that is a usual Marxist demand. Well, then is quick to smack down the degrowth movement as absurd. He says, it is absurd to claim or infer that economic regression can somehow occur without human regression and that the populace will somehow willingly participate in creating its own economic and lifestyle degradation. We have to ask ourselves, what would happen if the degrowth movement policies were actually implemented in this country? Um, almost immediately, you would see an increase in poverty, 
an increase in need, an increase in indolence, which is laziness, uh, and an increase in demand for vital goods like medicine, food, and energy. Uh, and of course, the general decline of the human quality of life. So we started with that definition of capitalism. The interesting thing is that capitalism is actually the engine behind technological project, progress. And technological progress is the single best tool that humans have to combat, to combat any environmental threat. Because efficiency is the natural result of capitalism. And we see that today throughout society. Today, we make goods that require less material input than they did before. They are improved over their predecessors. Computers went from occupying entire rooms to being held in your hand. Cars went from burning through oil to being electric in many cases today. Uh, consumers, have an, consumers have an interest in green energy. That's just a fact. They do today. Consumers are interested in that. And capitalism has responded. We see increasing numbers of wind turbines, of solar panels. If you're really into it, you can buy solar panels to put on your house. You can buy an electric car. You can buy biofuel. You can even check a little box on your electric bill to source more of your energy from, um, from clean sources. All of that happened because of capitalism, because of the free market. The consumers demanded something, and capitalism responded with abundance. That is something that will not happen in the degrowth movement. The SmackDown continues. This is probably one of my favorites. Ann Rand is just such a smart person. And here's what uh, she had to say about um, Marxism and degrowth movement, environmentalism, and their hatred for uh, progress and capitalism. She says, instead of their old promises that collectivism would create universal abundance and their denunciations of capitalism for creating poverty, they are now denouncing capitalism for creating abundance. They are now exhorting you to feel guilty of exploiting land, air, and water, to scare you out of your wits with vague threats of an unknowable cosmic cataclysm, threats that cannot be checked, verified, or proved. Pretty impressive. Uh, well, then commented after, after he inserted that quote, he said, as you can see, it takes one and Rand to respond to all of these uh, environmental nuts out there. I thought that was pretty clever. Let's remember that in the 70s, climate alarmists were concerned about a, uh, an ice age coming on. Then in the 90s and early 2000s, it was global warming. Even more recently, they've adapted their language again. It's now neither global, war global warming nor global cooling. It is simply climate change. They don't even have to be right about the sign of the change anymore. It simply change is enough to support their theory. It's a pretty sly trick. So just pay attention to that. Reality of natural resources. Environmental justice people look at natural resources as finite and thus uh, the consumption of natural resources is uh, essentially a moral evil. And that's where the de degrowth movement com comes from. However, it's important to understand natural resources a little bit differently. Natural resources are only resources because they are a product of human intelligence. And what I mean by that is iron ore is just a rock unless you know how to do something useful with it. Oil is not useful unless you know how to refine it and make it useful. As man's technology and knowledge grows, he will come to progressively master and increase the natural resources at his disposal. But that will not happen in a degrowth economy. If you think that science and technology are going to advance at similar rates as they are in our capitalist system right now, as they would in a degrowth economy, that's simply delusional. Uh, right now, man is using just a fraction of natural resources that will become available to him. So uh, we really need to focus on developing our science and technology uh, in the free market principle environment that we have right now. Climate science in schools, it's, it's probably no secret, but only one side of this concept is taught in school. And that, that side obviously aligns with the left. Uh, it's more indoctrination. Any book that you open is going to say, 
climate take change is happening. It is man's fault. The polar bears are going to die. We need to do something about it. And it's, it's climate alarmist uh, all the way down uh, from your K through 12 schools. Um, the kids are being inculcated with the environmental, political, and economic ideology with respect to climate change. They're never presented the other side of the coin. Uh, and that's just further evidence of uh, the indoctrination, which is a theme in every one of these special interest groups. They want to indoctrinate somebody in one way or another. And this is how the, the climate science, uh, the, climate, the climate people do it in schools. Okay. That's Captain Planet, if anybody didn't know that. Um, that was a cartoon I used to watch when I was a kid. And he was all about saving the earth, uh, but environmental, uh, environmental justice is not about saving the environment. It's about political power. And uh, it's about politics and power rather than science. Climate science claims that uh, catastrophe is possible or likely based on their models and projections, which are not testable, but don't have to be testable. All they have to do is convince you that catastrophe or cataclysm is possible, or even likely, and they have a great many people convinced that it is likely. And if you think that, then you are going to be willing to give the government uh, the power to take extreme measures to address that pending catastrophe that you think is coming. And that is how the government is going to do things like uh, push for the elimination of fossil fuels. They're going to spend ungodly amounts of money on mitigation tactics. And of course, uh, you wouldn't be Marxist if you didn't include redistribution of resources. Recurring theme, environmental justice equals Marxism equals critical race theory. David Pellows sums this up nicely for us in his quote. Principles of environmental justice, which not only embrace a system of anti-racism and eco ecological sustainability, but also support anti-militaristic, anti-imperialist, and gender justice policies. Uh, he was able to jump from environmental justice to gender justice policies in one sentence. Those things are, those things are kind of far away from each other. It kind of impressive. It just shows how, how deeply intertwined all of these movements are um, when, when you get to looking at the, the basic Marxist theories that they coalesce around. All right. On to chapter six, propaganda, censorship, and subversion. Um, journalism is no longer journalism. It's propaganda now. Journalists shape the news around their own ideologies and opinions, and they've really abandoned the role of reporter for that of social activists. Um, examples of what I just described. Everybody probably remembers the COVID death count on CNN disappeared the day that Joe Biden was elected. Uh, parents that have been protesting at school board meetings over the summer have been declared by the media as domestic terrorists and, and, the, and the government, in fact, by Merrick, Merrick Garland. And there's a near constant attack on red state COVID policy, but only attacks. Everybody in this room probably knows that COVID cases in Florida and Texas right now are going down, 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 down. Have you heard about that on the news? No, I haven't heard about that on the news because it's just propaganda anymore. What the media does today, well, then says, the press not only starts and prolongs quarrels, but thrives today on the exploitation of issues and agendas that serve the purpose of various Marxist movements and in doing so inflames and divides the entire nation along ideological lines. I will go a step further and point out that the media nearly completely controls the national discussion. Yes, they can prolong quarrels, but they can also shorten them or they can keep them out of the media altogether. We saw during Donald Trump's presidency, the Russia hoax covered on all of the major networks every single day for four years, we saw that. Joe Biden royally screwed up in Afghanistan like six weeks ago. He got Marines killed, he left people behind, he abandoned allies, and it's not even in the news right now. 
the, the, the issue about the Dave Chappelle comedy special has been covered for a longer period of time than Joe Biden's withdrawal, catastrophic withdrawal from Afghanistan. That is a demonstration of power that I don't really have my head wrapped around, that the media can control the narrative to that degree. It's quite impressive. I wish I had a better understanding and answer for you, but something for everybody to consider. Pseudo events. These are staged press events. Instead of reporting facts, the media infuses pseudo events with their own ideology. They are intended to deceive, control, and direct people and are critical to promoting Marxist and totalitarian movements. Everybody knows what that picture is. That's a recent example of a pseudo event. Um, of course, that's the, the, uh, the Border Patrol guy who uh, is on his horse and the claim was he was whipping Haitian migrants. Remember that after this news story broke, Joe Biden was on TV within hours, slamming his fist on the podium and saying that these border patrol guys, we're gonna, we're gonna punish them. We're gonna, we're gonna, this is not us, this is not America, we're gonna punish these guys. Like two days before, Joe Biden killed an entire family of Afghans with a predator drone, an entire innocent family of Afghans. Like two days before, and he has the gall to get up a few hours after this story breaks and say that he's gonna punish the border patrol guy. Well, who's gonna punish the people that blew up that family in Afghanistan? Incredible double standard. The hypocrisy is, is, is somewhat mind numbing. Okay, public journalism. This is a new spin on the press. It's the new way that the press see themselves. Public journalism, um, it's not reporting, but it's encouraging activism. Only, only the kind of activism that the left likes though, of course, if you remember that uh, lockdown protests were awful and horrible, but BLM protests were mostly peaceful and largely forwarded and praised by the media. Journalists will say of public journalism that it is not about politics or ideology, but it's about problem solving and serving the community. And as I said, it's the new way that journalists view themselves. See, it's them serving the community. It is, it is them helping us because they are the specials. They are our betters, they're smarter, they are our saviors. That's why I picked this guy holding a book and a pen. You know, he's a saint or something like, something like that. And that, that's how journalists now view themselves. They're here to save us because we're not smart enough to make our own decisions. And I, uh, I think this phenomenon has kind of blossomed out of the 2016 election. I think that during the 2016 election, you saw a whole lot of journalists sever their commitment to objectivity and impartiality when Donald Trump emerged as a serious candidate. Um, that gave them the excuse that they were looking for to, to essentially show their true colors and abandon their journalistic principles. I remember reading news articles back then where, or listening to news broadcasts where the anchors or the writers would openly say that we are going to cover Donald Trump differently because he is dangerous and he is such a threat to democracy. They openly said that. And you'll notice that Donald Trump is gone, but they have not returned to their journalistic principles. And just as they said back then, they're, they're going to save us. They were going to save us for Donald Trump. That was their excuse to, um, to, to move, to start reporting things ideologically how they really wanted to, instead of holding to any kind of journalistic standard. And now, Trump's gone, so they just say, well, I'm just, I'm just a public journalist now. I'm just here to help you. I'm just here to save you. So it's all kind of sick. It really kind of makes me, it makes me gag. Okay, repression, self-censoring, and cancel culture. Robert Henderson had a, a good quote about um, cancel culture. 
He said, it is no longer enough to be ideologically pure by current standards. One must have always held the proper beliefs. Um, if, you, if you haven't held the proper beliefs for all time, um, people can go back into your past and pluck selective things that you have said or written, and they can get you canceled or fired or get your statues taken down or change the name of the street that's named after you. Um, so I have to say, I do kind of look forward to uh, renaming all the streets that um, are currently named after Barack Obama, because if you guys don't remember, in 2008, he ran on a platform that uh, supported heterosexual marriage. And of course, that is not a proper belief today. So I think that Barack Obama must be canceled. We'll see if that happens. Okay, endless surveys, surveys indicate that Americans are becoming less and less comfortable with expressing their thoughts. Um, that is, that's very dangerous. That breeds further self-censorship and leads people to become uh, pretty comfortable with, uh, with lying or, or again, just being silent. Um, it leads to a dangerous type of group think where people will not speak out and they will acquiesce to bad ideas because they have, they have misperceived that so many people accept something. If somebody in here comes up with a really bad policy idea um, and, and, and they suggest that that be implemented and nobody speaks up, well, then there are gonna be some people in this room that, that think, well, maybe I should go along with it because it seems like everybody else is. So you have this phenomenon of, 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 of self-censorship and, and people not speaking up when they should, uh, and it can lead to some pretty bad policy being implemented. So the answer to that is to speak out and not back down. Just, I mean, you don't have to get in debates with people, but you need to state your opposition to things that you disagree with. Because uh, if you do that, you'll empower somebody else to do the same thing and that will spread, but the silence will spread equally. And the, the, uh, uh, the refusal to speak out will, will spread as well. So um, do it with me and stand up when you have the opportunity. I'm doing everywhere I can now. Tech censorship, it's almost not worth talking about because it's so commonplace, but there was a pretty good list in this book of the top 10 tech censorship events uh, that have occurred so far. I picked my favorite three. They were Parler being erased from the internet. That was pretty impressive. The New York Post uh, and the Hunter Biden story being killed. That was effectively killed by the media the, like, the week before the election. Pretty impressive. And then Instagram removing FBI crime statistics because they were deemed racist. Actual, just government data compiled by the Department of Justice, Instagram kicked it off because they said that the data was racist. Pretty impressive. Okay, here's the thing going on right now. <clears throat> it's about regulating social media. The Democrats really wanna regulate social media. They want to regulate social media so that they can, they can censor conservative speech. Some conservatives want to regulate social media. I say that's a terrible idea. Some conservatives want to regulate social media so that they can expand the platform for conservative speech and prevent censorship. So two very different ideas uh, of, of why social media should be uh, controlled. But here's the excuse that's going to be used. And that excuse is, uh, that online speech leads to, um, leads to, or online hate speech leads to hate crimes in reality. So somebody commissioned a study, the NTIA report on hate speech. The NTIA is the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. Uh, and they issued this report on the role of telecommunications in hate crimes. This report was withheld from the public. It found no evidence that online speech led to an increase in hate crimes. It admonished big tech and the government for censorship practices, and it compared the practices used by big tech to practices used by the Chinese Communist Party. No wonder it wasn't made public, it didn't fit the narrative, and it didn't give the Democrats the excuse that they needed to come in and regulate these social media platforms. Did I do?
I don't think I did that menu. There we go. Okay. Okay. So the conclusion of this chapter. Well, then sums it up really well. The intersectional movements that form the core of the uh, the core of American Marxism are largely supported by the Democratic Party and promoted by the media. Of this, there can no longer be any doubt. Therefore, speech, debate, and challenges to Marxist-centric ideas are not tolerated. The purpose is societal and economic transformation. The means are social advocacy and activism. Opposition must be denounced, besmirched, and crushed. That's censorship. Thomas Paine, The American Crisis Number One. I hadn't read this until, um, until I read this book. The first time I read it, it got goosebumps. So I will read it to you guys here tonight. <clears throat> this was written about uh, probably the most trying time in the Revolutionary War when uh, in the winter of 1776, when George Washington and his men were at camp and freezing to death and eating their horses and a bunch of other nasty stuff, apparently. Here's what Thomas Paine said. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of their country but he that stands by it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered, yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. Heaven knows how to put a proper price upon its goods. And it would be a strange thing indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. I call not upon a few, but upon all, not on this state or that state, but upon every state. Up and help us, lay your shoulders to the wheel. Better to have too much force than too little when so great an object is at stake. Let it be told to the future of the world that in the depth of winter, when nothing but hope and virtue could survive, that the city and the country, alarmed at one common danger, came forth to meet and repulse it. Got goosebumps again. That's a really good, it's a really good letter from Thomas Paine. George Washington read that to his troops to motivate them um, that winter and likely provided the mental fuel they needed to go on and win the Revolutionary War. I read that to you now so that you get energized about these tactics that Levin suggests we can use to help fight Marxism today. BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. You've probably heard that discussed in the context of uh, Israel. Yeah, mostly, right? Um, Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, they're real big proponents of uh, using BDS tactics against, uh, against Israel. But we can use them against uh, our Marxist opponents here in the United States. Everybody knows what a boycott is. Don't support your political enemies. I have not bought a Coke or Coke product in over a year. Ever since they made, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I, hope, I hope that you guys are thinking of, of things to do like that as well. Another interesting concept is reverse boycotting. If you hear about a leftist organized boycott, you should go out and attempt to reverse boycott. There's some great examples out there and they're so satisfying. Um, the Goya food CEO said that, um, said something positive about Trump. And he was, uh, then had a leftist boycott organized against him. And people said, no, 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 we're not gonna allow that. And they went out and they bought all the Goya products off the shelves, they literally sold out stores. So reverse boycotting is a pretty satisfying uh, thing to do. Dive, <laughs> good. Divestment, urge businesses to stop supporting Marxist movements. Um, basically send emails to advertisers. Um, if the, the New York Times has like people on staff that just watch conservative news and read conservative news. And when they see something that they think um, is, is, is objectionable enough that they can seize on it, they start inundating the advertisers of that Tucker Carlson show or that Laura Ingram show or whatever. They start inundating them with emails saying, I'm not going to buy your products anymore because you advertise on this show. And that person just said, you know, something I disagree with. And that can scare businesses. The left is really good at using that tactic to get advertisers to drop their support for conservative news shows. 
we need to do that same thing to, uh, to our, our political opponents. And it's way easier because they say 10 times the amount of objectionable things that are ever said on conservative news sources. So think about that. The next time you hear you know, some wackadoodle on MSNBC spouting off, think about maybe sending an email to uh, uh, whatever advertisers you shot, saw on that show that day. Finally, sanctions. Get, get the government to stop supporting Marxist movements. Great example of that is in Georgia, Delta. Uh, started mouthing off about the Georgia election laws and the state legislature says, okay, your tax break on jet fuel is gone. That was pretty satisfying. Uh, this iPad went dead. Can you go to the next slide? Education. Okay, a couple things you can do in education. Go to your local school board meetings. I started doing it. It's a fun time. Um, Basically, uh, I feel kind of bad for school board members because you kind of have to just sit there and listen to everybody complain about them, but um, it does let them know what's on your mind uh, and, and, and they can certainly be fun in this day and age. Enlist a lawyer in your community if you find something going on in your schools that, uh, that you think is illegal or wrong. Uh, a lot of lawyers will do pro bono work. The left is great at filing lawsuits for the drop of a hat. Conservatives do not use uh, that tool nearly enough we should be uh, finding lawyers that we can team up with and filing lawsuits on a more regular basis. I know that several have been filed through the uh, stopcriticalracetheory.com sister organization to empower you. So take an example from that. Finally, do not send your children to Marxist colleges. Don't send them to Marxist public schools. Um, just uh, stop feeding that fire. And I know we're short on time here. So my last uh, slide is we have to win elections and hold our, a, uh, hold our politicians accountable. It seems today that the pendulum swings wildly leftward and it never really returns to the right. Um, I think Donald Trump is the only person in my recent memory who had moderate success pushing the pendulum rightward when he was able to cut taxes and he ordered critical race theory banned from all government federal training. Um, and, but, but even he didn't do enough. I remember this scenario in 2018 when the House was on the line, right? We had, the Republicans had the presidency, the House and the Senate in 2018 midterms come up. And we were hoping to hold on to the House and it didn't happen. And before the election, I was listening to all these politicians, all these people talk about how they thought that the midterm elections weren't gonna be secure, that there was gonna be, you know, some people voting in these elections who shouldn't be voting. And I got so angry at those Republicans saying that. I thought, you guys just had two years to do something about securing the elections. And you didn't do a darn thing about it. That burned me up. So we have to win elections and then we have to hold those people accountable and make them do what we want to do. One more slide, just a few final thoughts. Be really quick. Okay, Marxism is bad. I know that's a groundbreaking thought. It rejects individual freedom. It requires destruction of the free markets and existing society. It eliminates rights, including the right to private property. It is censorious, it is not tolerant, and it thrives on conflict. Today, we are mired in special interest groups that are forwarding Marxism. But below their top line moniker, they are all pushing for the same Marxist goals. Finally, start labeling these leftist movements for what they really are. They are Marxist. Thank you all very much. It has been a pleasure. Let's, um, let's, can we um, take a couple comments, questions? Sure. Anybody have anything they want to right here? I'm Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. Um, why would you keep calling everything Marxist? Why don't we just call it communist? Don't more people understand communist philosophy than they would understand Marxist philosophy? That is a good question. Thank you. Um, I suppose that I called everything Marxist because I'm presenting Mark Levin's book, and, and that's the term. And that's the term that he uses. I don't disagree with you that perhaps communism would uh, maybe be a, a more mentally accessible term, a more accessible term for a lot of people, because that a lot of people, yeah. Yep. 
Russia, Cuba. Yeah. People understand all of those communist countries all around the world. And then here in America, we keep talking about American Marxism. And I understand why you talked about American Marxism. Yeah. But that's kind of been my kind of bugaboo. Like, why are we going on that term Marxism, which is accurate? Yeah. But I think people understand communism better. That's that's a fair point. One, one, one other thing I'll offer is that um, communism is a, a form of political um, it's, it's a political form of government where Marxism is more of kind of an overarching theory, right? Let's so. take another question right here. My name's Mike. Hey, Mike. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you, sir. Okay. I know this sounds very dark, but if you look at liberalism throughout history, your three greatest liberals of all time, which would be Stalin, Hitler, and Mao, all dealt with genocide. And whoever got in their way, was uh, liquidated and eliminated. Yeah. Um, how soon do you think the left uh, is planning to actually eliminate people that they don't like, and, and especially Christians and especially patriots? Well, I think, I think they, they will have a pretty hard time of that. Uh, it's interesting that the tools that you would need to actually do something like that, they despise, right? Because all those people that you just mentioned, the left, uh, they despise um, uh, the Second Amendment, and that's why you know we have the Second Amendment to protect ourselves from things like that from happening. Those people do not possess the same tools, so they cannot use those tools against us to inflict that kind of damage. But I will comment on one thing that you said that that the liberals are the uh, uh, the, the the threat. And you mentioned you know the the Marxist leaders that that we talked about. I would say that liberals. Um, Liberals aren't a threat in that, in that sense. Liberals are actually people that, that value freedom. These Marxists do not. Marxists do not value freedom. And the people that you described are, are Marxists. Um, there is a, there, there's a big uh, conversation going on today that liberals actually need to um, split from the radical left of their party because what you're seeing right now with this push towards censorship and push towards control and push towards eliminating minority rights in the Senate, those are very illiberal ideas. And liberals should not go along with that. They should separate themselves from the radical left and start um, voting for principles and policies of freedom. One last question that's online in the back, Luke. Okay. Quick question, yeah, online. Uh, this person is wondering, does Levin paint a picture of how our economy theoretically would be structured under Marxism? Wondering if it would be probably not, you know, the actual seizing of private property, but maybe state corporatism like we see in China. Yeah, in this book, Mark, uh, <clears throat> Mark Levin did not really do any supposing on that, but I think any uh, any trait of the government uh, beginning to inch toward complete control of the means of production, the economy, is going to be done through heavy-handed regulation. Uh, and Dan just mentioned that the Fed is considering uh, ways to do wages and price controls already through, yes. through the tools they have. So uh, I think you'll start to see uh, a slow encroachment uh, and the, the hands of government tightening around individual rights in that way. Let's give our uh, speaker one last round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, um, so I thought I gave Luke a really hard assignment when I asked him to do this class and, and he's got a young family and he works so hard on this. And I just, I had a little something extra in my, in my closet upstairs, a little something for the kids for Halloween, oh. Gustavo. The Shy Ghost. Let's thank, thank him again. Thank you very much. Enjoy it. It's for much the family. appreciated. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for taking pleasure. it on. And we'll let Thanks, you, uh, everybody. All and right. Just a couple things, housekeeping things before you leave that I have to tell you. So Vivek Ramaswamy has called me three or four times since he had to cancel our class. He's very distressed about it. But there will be about 30 signed books of his, Woke Inc., if anybody wants a signed copy for Christmas, drop us a note. We'll save you one. They were supposed to be here last night, but his uh, 
event that he went to, there was a protest outside that caused quite a big deal at the Kenwood Country Club, from what I understand. So if you want one of Evic's books, just jot us a note. I wanted to just encourage you, if you know anybody that's thinking about leaving their public schools to come to the homeschooling uh, class or watch it virtually on Saturday, it's going to be a great event. I just can't uh, overstate that for you. And um, at Vivek's class that we had to cancel, oh, the winner of tonight's online um, prize is Mary Kay. She uses a fuse.net address. Congratulations, Mary. We'll get with you on that. Two handouts. One, when we had to cancel our class with Vivek, we had the guy coming in from the great parks of Hamilton County to talk about his 107% tax increase. Um, we weren't able to have him, but he did send us over some literature. You're free to pick it up from Mr. Roll in the back. Pick up our other handout on the Fed uh, with wage and price controls. And I want to uh, thank you for coming tonight. I hope everybody enjoyed Luke's presentation. And have a great night. Thank, thank you. you. That was fun, dude. Thanks again.